Um, hello and uh, good evening. Um, welcome to what's the... Oh, very exciting. Um, <laughs> it's not karaoke, I'm not about to burst into song. Um, welcome, I'm Oriana Badley, I'm Dean of Research for the University, and uh, I'd like to say thank you to you all for coming to what's the first of uh, 2015's professorial platforms, but I'm sure you don't care about that, because what you've come to is the platform by Chris Wainwright, um, and we're all very much looking forward to it. But if I could first of all introduce the brave soul who's going to try and interrogate Chris and get him to reveal interesting things about himself. Um, we're very lucky to have today with us um, Quentin Cooper. Uh, all I can remember about him now, I've got this huge page, but he just told me he was a Man City fan. And my brain has just got <laughs> completely distracted by the game against Barcelona tomorrow. But um, Quentin's uh, said that all I needed to say about him was to ignore this whole page from the BBC website which talks about how he presents uh, Radio 4's weekly The Material World, which is the UK's most listened to science programme. Uh, and the fact that he's been spending an increasing amount of time dealing with issues surrounding climate change and the environment, and has been very engaged with the Science Art Cape for Well project, and that's where he first met Chris, I believe, and we'll hear more about that later. But um, the only thing I actually need to say about him is that he was described by the Times as the world's most enthusiastic man <laughs> and an expert on everything from pop music to astrophysics. Um, I actually thought even more interesting than that was that he was just involved in a global gathering of toy designers at the Lego HQ in Denmark, which all of us wish we'd been there. <laughs> but anyway, um, Quentin, can I pass over to you, please, to introduce Chris? Thank you. Thank you, Oriana. Yes, my four-year-old is particularly jealous of me having been at the Lego thing. And the reason you can ignore that large amount of biography is the material world is no longer with us. That's, so that is a dead biography. But the bit about being the world's most enthusiastic man is still just as false as it ever was. Uh, so thank you for coming. I am Quentin Cooper. I'm contractually obligated in this 21st century to say tweeting is at QWERTY. Uh, but that reminds me, we don't really want too much tweeting or phone activity, and please know going on to eBay to try and sell these lovely books you've just been given right now. We know you're all terribly important people, so if you can't turn your phones off, it would be very good if you could at least turn them to silent. So the plan for tonight is very simple. It's a great pleasure to be here for this uh, professorial platform lecture from Chris Rainwhite. Uh, the plan is I'm going to introduce Chris. He's going to talk for about an hour, hour and a half tops, uh, there'll be a couple of questions. No, he's Chris. If anybody's here who knows Chris, that was never going to happen. If you don't know Chris, what on earth are you doing here? It is St. Patrick's Day and there is Champions League football out there. Haven't you got better places to be? So as lectures go, this is one that's going to involve very little lecturing. Um, I could go into more details, but I think probably to explain the plan, such as there is one, we ought to get the professorial, professional welcome. So please put your paws, either spelling together please, for Professor Chris Wainwright. <laughs> Have a seat. So Chris, I know why you're here. I'm not entirely clear why I'm here. Why am I needed for something like this? This is your lecture. You've got this lovely book that you've given everybody to give the extra background detail. Am I not rather surplus to requirements? Is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> if it is, don't answer it. <laughs> well, I thought it would be useful just to slightly vary the mode of presentation from what we, we normally do at these, uh, these platforms. Not, not to say the rest of the platforms have not been probably far more engaging than I'm likely to be on my own, so it's useful to have someone to, to kind of keep the, the pace going when it starts to flag after about four minutes. Right, okay. Um, but I think also it's useful to share thoughts, because I don't claim unique authorship of most of the thoughts that I've got. They've always been <coughs> mediated by some other circumstances, or in, in the case of the work I'm going to show, they've often 
come about through partnership or through right. about a discussion. There are other so, voices in your head. We so can it's, talk so it's about seen, that. you seem logical to <laughs> let those voices in my head talk to the voices in your head, maybe. And, and haven't you had this job for a while? Why are we doing this now? Well, um, I've escaped for seven years from, for doing it, and partly because we've got lots of really amazing professors in the university, and uh, I think we'd be doing this every week, wouldn't we, Lynn, if we were to go through the process. So I've kind of stood back, you know, family stand back, as it were, and uh, eventually Lynn... Yeah, that bit about the phones, that was you I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> eventually Lynn kind of cornered me and said, it's about time you did right. this. And she gave me today's date, which I kicked and screamed and said, I'm not sure I want to do it tonight, but because of Champions League football and St. Patrick's Day in particular. Oh, you see, but, I thought uh, you'd chosen St. Patrick's night so that if you felt the need to get horribly drunk afterwards, you could just blend in. <laughs> I've never blended in anywhere because of being six foot four. Right. Um, but I'll try to blend in later. Guinness is black, so right. I've got half a chance. And no other significance to the date at all? Absolutely none whatsoever. <laughs> Every, <laughs> everything else is a wicked coincidence. All those cakes with your name on it, they just just yeah. a complete coincidence. Yeah, okay, absolutely. well look, I mean I say it's not going to be a traditional lecture, but before we get into a little bit more detail and have a bit more of a chat, we thought it would be an idea for Chris just to show us a couple of things to give us pause for thought. Sure. So Chris, take it to the platform. Okay. You've got a book. <laughs> There is a temptation with these sorts of events to go through the last 40 years of work, and that would take an hour and a half, if not considerably longer. So I'm not intending to do that, but the, the publication which we put together does have a kind of summary of, of work in it, which uh, you know I'm not going to talk about all the work in that publication tonight by any means, but there are, there are bits of thread that you can, can refer to later if, uh, if you don't get a good price for it on eBay. Um, so, pause. Why, why pause? Um, one of the key reasons for using the, the term pause is it is an opportunity to have a, a summary of some of the work that's, that's, that's taken place over the last few decades. But I, I don't want to en enter into a kind of post-rationalisation of that work. It's, it's not something I'm that, that keen on doing. And, I find slightly irritating to suddenly find 20 years later you've got the answer for something that you did 20 years previously, when in fact at the time of making it you probably had no idea why you were doing it. So I'm kind of nervous about that kind of post-rationalisation process. <coughs> Although I think there are opportunities to, to kind of stand back and have a look at things. And pause also is, it, it's as you can see from the, the image, the the two red lines are, are a symbol for, for pause, both in the language of semaphore, which I use quite a lot, but also it's, it's in common use. Any, any bit of technology you've got has a kind of a double, double line on it when you want to pause a bit of equipment or pause the process. So it seemed appropriate to, to marry the two, two things together. And I'm, I'm quite interested in languages that don't, don't necessarily resonate very much with, with, with the, the kind of common language or the common notions of how we communicate. And I, I thought I'd just start with putting up the, 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 the first message that was ever broadcast by Morse code in 1844. This was a commercial broadcast and it says, what hath God wrought? Which is uh, taken from the um, the book of Numbers 23 in the Bible. I'm not putting it there for a kind of religious purpose, but that's just the origins of where that, that piece of text comes from as translated into Morse code. I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, but I wanted just to show a few examples of work that's, that's really been a kind of background count of a lot of the work that I've made since uh, I started making work professionally. And there's just three, three artists who I wanted just to kind of register as a, as a source of uh, both inspiration but also reference to the, the way they expressed their uh, engagement with the landscape. So it's a painting by Joseph Wright of Derby from 1848. 
from 1789. It's a pen and ink drawing by Samuel Palmer from 1835 and uh, John Martin painting The Great David's Wrath from 1853. What, what's common to all these images is the, the kind of nocturnalness. They're, they're, they're very much about the relationship of the, um, the world as seen at night, but also its relationship to things otherworldly, the stars, the moon, the heavens, the spirits, and so on. In other words, that, that which we don't know or can't see, or that which we can see but don't really understand. So, so the moon as, a, as an image has, has been something which uh, has, has, has kind of always been a reference point for humanity and it continues to have you know, significance not just scientifically and astronomically but also um, emotionally and spiritually and so on. So it's, it's been a kind of recurring image or recurring reference throughout the work. And I, I thought I'd just start, and this is the only kind of reference I'm going to make to, to previous work. This is a piece I made 40 years ago in, in Derbyshire, which was uh, a, a very short journey from the top of a, a hilltop um, mound in, in Derbyshire down to a, a small lake uh, called Robin Hood Stride. Now, I'll show you a piece of work I made last year, and those of you who are not particularly generous will probably say I've not moved very far in 40 <laughs> years. Uh, I have discovered colour, <laughs> and uh, instead of journeying down a hill, it's journeying to and from a boat moored out uh, in the Sound of Mull. So those, I mean, those two images kind of, if you like, encapsulate what, what's been a very complex journey, but actually are, are starting to have a kind of elliptical relationship of, of rediscovering and rethinking some of those very early um, tentative experiments with photography. So I'll just show two or three projects and give Quinton a bit of a, a handle to... Uh, come in on some, some discussion. Uh, this is a series of work made in Disco Bay in, in Greenland where both uh, Quinton and I were on the Cape Farewell expedition there run by David Buckland who's sitting over there. Thanks David. Um, I think I have to acknowledge that that particular project was a real starting point for a, a body of work which I'm still very kind of much referencing uh, the, the importance of that, that particular trip. So this is a, a body of work called Red Ice, White Ice. And it's a, a series of quite large scale photographs made, again, at, at night, um, using um, flash, coloured flash. There's no Photoshop anywhere near any of the pictures. Uh, everything that's there is made as a kind of live, live performance. And in a, in a sense, it kind of takes the work back to some of the, uh, the painting references. Instead of using ink and paint, I'm painting with light, effectively. So it's, it's kind of looking at the way the combination of performative, of location, and photographic kind of sensibilities come together. I mentioned collaboration when we were having a kind of preamble chat. I, I think most of the work that I'm going to show has really come about through either very, very genuine collaboration or at least um, absolutely necessary cooperation. So these pictures couldn't have been made without three other people being involved in, in, in the process. Um, so carrying a studio flash kit and generator on a small boat with three people and the film crew was kind of quite challenging. So there are, there are six people involved in make, making these, these images. I think again that's where the kind of authorship issue comes in for me. It's, it's often the, the work is, is negotiated through a series of um, opportunities to be in certain locations which are not always ones that I could 
find myself without someone else actually taking the initiative to put something together of the scale of the expedition that Cape Fair well put together. And also the, the, the combinations of, of, of the willingness and skills of people to go out at the middle of the night in minus 30 degrees and, and work, and, and also things like the weather and timings and so on. So the work is actually very much about how you can work with and mobilise and negotiate with a group of people. Just to uh, give you a bit of idea of the, the scale of the, the finished work in that series. The second set of pictures, um, again from, from the Arctic, and uh, this is from a, an expedition to, to Svalbard in 2012 with uh, a very, very small uh, group of, of artists and uh, I think there's only four of us. Uh, there's myself, Sophie Cowell, and Rebecca Solnit and Juan Fantabero. And we, we were a very, very lean, well lean, <laughs> we were a very lean kind of crew in the sense of, uh, you know, it was a very, very small, almost kind of boutique expedition, if you like, on a, on a very small boat. And one of the things that we did was we watched films every night on the boat and Re Rebecca showed um, Kenneth Branagh's 1994 film, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which I'm not going to explain the story, most of you probably know it, but the end of the story is, uh, well, the beginning of the story is Frankenstein is in the Arctic escaping and he's come across his, his, uh, his maker and appears on the ice and he, vi he finally takes Frankenstein, the, 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 the creator of the monster, away who dies, and they both end up dying and going off on this, this ice float. That's a really, really short <laughs> <laughs> summary, not a particularly accurate summary, but you get the idea of, of a very, very com complex story, which actually is pretty much around uh, the kind of origins of climate change as well, given where it was written in Switzerland. But more of that some of the time. But th this, this kind of image stuck in my mind, and we, we sort of you know, travel around some of these areas with huge icebergs and, and boats. And I, I made a series of pictures which uh, kind of followed or referenced that, that particular story, which again meant going out in, into fjords in the middle of the night uh, in freezing cold temperatures, persuading people to dress up like a monster. So, okay. Um, I'm going to skip really fast now to a couple of projects from, from Japan, and the, the, they're, they're both related. The, the, the first project is called the Catalogue of Errors, and this is a, a picture I made in 2009 of a, a fishing fleet off the coast of Amori, um, which is this, the area of Japan where the earthquake happened in 2011. And the, the, the image kind of references the, the Morse code imagery of the, the first slide I showed, of this kind of coding of light uh, on, on the horizon, which was a series of dots and dashes in, in quite a random sequence. So I made a series of pictures around this, this, this moving fishing fleet as it, as it circled around the, uh, the shores. And then 11th of March 2011 was the, the earthquake off the coast of um, northeastern Japan and I, I, I was in that region four days before the, the earthquake and tsunami and uh, I've been going back there ever since really. I just wanted to put in a couple, couple of slides that contextualize that. This is a, an image of the namazu which is a catfish and in, in popular Japanese tradition, I'm sure Toshio might correct me here if I'm wrong, but th there is a common belief that sitting underneath Japan is this giant catfish which is held in place by one of the gods and if the god falls asleep or loses concentration the catfish starts wriggling and that's how earthquakes uh, happen. So the, the image of the Namazu is, is within the kind of popular culture or within the kind of mythology of, of Japan. So there's a kind of fatalism about 
about earthquakes. They've always happened and they, they always will happen. I think that's important as a kind of context for what actually happened there in, in March 2011. So these are just a couple of images from 2012, which is a year after. So I, I made a series of semaphore pieces called errors, which uh, uses the, the, the signal for error. If you make a mistake, you, you do this. So I, I chose a number of locations around the coast where the relationship between the, the land and the sea has been changed forever. That, 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 that interface is, 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 has moved. And the huge amount of consequences to that, not just physical, but also social and economic. And this is a, a, a screen grab of what the, the night sky looked like on the 3rd of, sorry, 11th of March 2011, as, as seen from the Almori district, where I've been working since. And this was also a starting point for a, a second body of work called We Are All Stars, which I'll explain in a second. There's also a piece which I made out of that project, which is uh, an installation piece which uh, spells out the text accidents will happen. And in the background, there's a, a Geiger counter reading of uh, fallout levels from around Fukushima. And the final few pictures are from, from last year, which is uh, part of the ongoing project called We're, We're All Stars. And I've been working with a group of artists, including Robin Jenkins, who's here somewhere. I think some of you may have, there he is, may have come to his talk last week, where we're working with local communities to look at how we can bring a, a kind of cultural uh, aspect into the, the kind of rebuilding and regenerating, rethinking about, about the region. And we've, we've, we've been very lucky to have this base in a place called Horaikan uh, on the coast, which is an area that was affected by the, the tsunami. And so this is a hotel called the Horaikan, which uh, is very generously playing host to a number of projects, cultural projects by different organizations, including ourselves, who who are working out of there to, to try and generate some, um, some projects. Robin's project is um, looking at um, the, the kind of rescue service there and is designing a boat, which he's talked about uh, previously. Um, I'm working with a musician from, from Berlin, um, looking at putting together kind of sound and, and, and visual uh, workshops to then lead to a series of performances. And the, the, the hotel is owned and run by this woman, um, Akika, who herself was a tsunami survivor. And every morning she shows the people in the hotel uh, a film of what happened to her when she um, was taken away by the tsunami, but then somehow miraculously was pulled to safety. You're going to hear a loud noise now, so I'll just warn you.
Okay, so every morning she shows that film, which is the footage taken by local people who witnessed her being swept away by the, the floods and trapped underneath a, a truck and then being, being pulled out of the, the water some, some time later. And we've, we've then um, worked with her and with other people to listen to their stories and listen to the the kind of responses that they're now having to what's happening in the area. And one of the most compelling stories that I heard was that on the night of the uh, tsunami on the 11th of March, all the electricity went because clearly, you know, everything was destroyed. And the, the stars that night were brighter than people ever remembered. And there was then, at that, at that point, um, a way of trying to kind of rationalise what had happened to all the people who'd been swept out to sea who would never be seen again and how they might have actually already have been transferred to the stars so they'd, they'd left the, the earthly environment and had occupied this, this, this kind of uh, spiritual environment. So people were looking at the stars as, as some way of trying to make sense of the people who were missing. And these are some, some works that I made with people just asking them to to try and visualize what, what their thoughts were, what their feelings were about certain words that they were thinking. So whilst it's not a kind of language like semaphore or, or Morse code, there's, there's no interpretation of it other than the kind of gestural uh, mark that's made purely out of a kind of instinctive response to how, how they want to express their, their feelings. These are a couple of more formal pieces um, which are Again, using words and texts and recollections from people about um, their feelings about what their, their future is, what, what decisions they have to make in this case, and also what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen in the future. So these are very much kind of literal interpretations of those words through, through semaphore. And this is a, a piece called Survive. OK, I'm, I'm almost finished. Um, Unusually, I've just put a piece of work in which is a work in progress, which is called uh, Carved into the Bone of a Turtle. And there's not a lot I can say about it other than I'm still working with the, the idea. And uh, it's one of those phrases that's a bit, bit like an earworm. You know, you, you sometimes listen to a piece of music and you can't get it out of your head. And this phrase kind of came, came to me. I'm not even sure where it came from, but it's a kind of persistent phrase which has uh, references in a kind of shamanistic process of carving um, lines into turtle shells and burning them and then seeing how the shells crack and reading the, the cracking of the shells as some kind of uh, signalling for, for future behaviour. So this is carved into the bone of a turtle which was made at the end of the moon festival in Taiwan uh, last year and so it's a, it's a work in progress. And the very last slide is the very last commercial Morse code message ever broadcast in 1997 by the French Navy. And it says, calling all, this is our last cry before our eternal silence. Thank you. You should have some eternal silence now, but we're not going to. It's always difficult when the interviewee during the presentation says you're nervous about the post-rationalisation process because <laughs> surely that's what the interview is, is a bit of post-rationalisation. But the poster tonight says, Chris Wainwright, that's you, will provide a brief outline of some of the sustained influences and concerns that have shaped the direction of his work over the past 40 years, which I think is what you've just done. Tick the box on that. You have ticked the box on that one. But any thoughts on why, of all the things these have become, why, what is it about the environment? What is it about the way of telling these stories that has particularly appealed to you? I, I think it... Can I get you to lean in a bit to your microphone? I can, well? I can lean as much as you like. I'll probably lean more later, but uh, <laughs> um, I shall try leaning now. Um, I, I think there's, there's, there's two or three things which contribute to that. That, that set of decisions about 
how the work's been produced and why. I think the first is um, a, a real sense of engagement and, 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 and wanting to understand painting, actually. That, that might sound a bit odd. No. But, but the, the first influence on the work have been very much to do with, um, with painting, with landscape. So, you know, right, right back at the start of any kind of aware formal education, that, that notion of being a painter was always quite exciting. And I think, you know, my, my background of living in a rural community in, in Derbyshire, where there was the reference to Joseph Wright in particular, that, that was a kind of an early, kind of, if you like, baseline, which has never really disappeared. Right, but very quickly, you seem to go beyond the, the picturesque, though, and you're, well, you, it's our yeah. relationship with this. Yeah, I, th I think the relationship is one that I think was established through an actual engagement with landscape. You know, I, I lived and worked and grew up in that sort of environment where, where, where the kind of natural order of things seemed, seemed quite logical and quite, quite, quite understandable uh, in the day-to-day. -day. You know, the, the influence of the seasons, the, the kind of agricultural framework that, that I was familiar with and so on. But, but I, I think then the other key factor, obviously, is, is, is a kind of photographic practice and, and, and a constant and, and, and still a fairly ambivalent notion of photography as a means of, of expression that I always feel kind of falls short of what, what painting can do. That might be a bit of an opening question to people to come back at. But, but in, in a sense, I've, I, yes. I, you know, I, I've kind of always had that frustration with, with the photographic process. But so far what you've said, this could equally explain why you've just had a lovely exhibition of pictures of dry stone walls at the Buxton Tea Rooms. You, know, that it's, you it's went all, to it. I'm yeah. happy. <laughs> <laughs> but, it doesn't, but it's this thing about also, it's, it's, it's this greater thing about our connection with the cosmos, our influence upon it as well, and its influence upon us that you seem to tap into as well. I, well, I, I, I think, first, first of all, the... I think the important thing is the, the kind of re, the revisiting of, of landscape, which is going on now through the awareness of climate change. You know, we we we, we can go back to art from the 70s or early 80s and find very little reference to to, to to climate because there was not so much awareness. Although Michael Snow, I think, in La Region Centrale, actually made a very very profound statement about you know, being very nervous about being in the natural world and not necessarily wanting to colonise it or to, to kind of add to it, or I think he said he didn't even borrow it. You know, he just kind of recognised that there was a need to, 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 to uh, kind of respect it. But I think it's only in the last probably 15 years or so that we've, we've become much, much more aware, and that's probably because of the, the escalation of the, the kind of climate uh, data and the, the, the climate debate persuading us that actually we are making a real fuck up of things if we, if we carry on living as we are doing and you know work of Cape Farewell and organisations like Cape Farewell have been instrumental in harnessing artists views and harness, harnessing artists into a position to actually address and comment on those things. But it is a, it is a shared to use your eloquent phrase, and it's great being not, not being on the radio. Uh, but <laughs> oh, sorry. But, <laughs> but so, what gives you the right, the responsibility? What gives you the reason to particularly draw draw attention to it? And is that what you think you're doing, or are you just simply reflecting it? Well, I I, th I think I'm reflecting. I, I also recognise the contradiction that we all have that we're contributing mm. to it. it. You know, there there are inbuilt contradictions there in our in our collective and individual behaviours. Um, but you know, I think in a way we also accept where we are. We're, we're, we're working as artists. My, my, my motivation is as much about making making art as it is about making comments about about climate or about you know any number of environmentally related issues. The the, the engagement with making is is paramount. You know, the, the, there's you know d despite the seriousness of the issues, there, there's a real joy in the making. There, there's a real satisfaction in actually being. You know, being somewhere, making something, coming back, looking at it, and saying, "Yeah, that seems to have worked." You made a joke about how you're the, from the picture of Robin Hood stride thirty something years ago to now, you've only gone from black and white to being in colour. There are clearly patterns to what you do. What is? Are there? 
a way to sum up what your creative process is like? Is there something that is any way typical? Obviously, it's a range of work, but are there? I, I think I, I think I've narrowed things down to only working at night, which uh, I think is is something that I've evolved as a sort of. Uh, a focus because I, you know, if you if you pick up a camera and work with cameras, there, there's so many distractions to what you can can do with a camera and where you can go with it and how you can use it. I, I I've always thought of the photographic process being a bit like working with a, a blank piece of paper that you, you you selectively put lines on a piece of paper and you eventually you make a composition of some sort. And I wanted to use photography in the same sort of way of actually reducing information coming into the camera by working in a dark environment or working in one where there was very little information coming in and then adding to that the kind of characteristics that, that build build the picture. Was that a conscious move or did you but just wake, wake up no. one day and realise you'd become nocturnal? Wake, uh, wake up one day. <laughs> <laughs> that question could be rephrased better. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, no, I, I, it was a conscious thing. It was, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a product of my education as much as anybody in terms of art school education and that those sort of debates about photographic practice and its relationship to other media and it, it's, its function as a recording tool, um, the performative aspects of the work. Photography seemed to be a way that, that could, could become almost like a passive audience to, to actions and activities and then record those and then replace them. Now you used the phrase when you were showing about giving me a handle on things, but one thing that's always struck me coming from a journalistic background is that however complicated, however multi-layered the things you're doing are, you always give them a very catchy yet slightly enigmatic title to lure us in. You've got We Are All Stars, we've got <coughs> A Happiness, where we've got Where Ice Comes to Die. Is that conscious attempt to kind of be slightly intriguing? Well, the, the, well those two titles, the first one was We Are All Stars, was, was, was part of a conversation of talking to people from the Tohoka region, listening to people's stories about what the night sky looked like. You know, there was a bit of translation going on, people trying to explain what they felt. And it wasn't me, I, I can't remember who came up with the title, but someone said, we are all stars. You know, and that was part of the, the, the discussion about we're all going to end up as stars at some point, and some people are stars already. So that kind of evolved out of a, a conversation. It might have been a misheard Joni Mitchell there. It might have been a misheard Joni Mitchell there. I completely <laughs> accept that. Um, and the, the Where Ice Comes to Die was... Um, that was a headline from uh, the Daily Mail, which uh, was published on the 16th of uh, September 2012, when there was uh, a recognised um, recording of the lowest levels of, of sea ice in, in the, the Arctic ever... ever never recorded. So I just pinched the title from the Daily Mail, which I thought... But once, with the thought that you might snag a few people who yeah. otherwise would... Yeah. And who are those people you're... Do you think about who that us is, who you're reaching? No, not, not particularly. Or do you just do it and not see who turns up? Yeah. A bit like tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the, the Geiger counter piece was uh, lifted from Elvis Costello. You know, accidents will happen. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I try not to sort of get too, you know too kind of singular about the references in the work. You know, I, I steal from wherever I can. You know, but those pieces, I mean, the, the, error, the error pieces, the accidents yeah. will happen, some of the stuff around We Are All Stars, I mean, these, some of the stories that, you know, around what's happened since Fukushima, mm -hmm. some of the mm -hmm. things documented in this book, Happiness, which we haven't really talked about yet, but I think, but which shows all these pictures of these giant caravan parks, effectively, yeah. that people have been moved into, people are still paying the mortgages sure, on homes sure. that no longer exist. This seems to me not just getting art and science together, but you're getting into the realms of journalism. These are good journalistic stories. Is that an instinct that you're drawing on as well? Um, I, I, I don't think of it as journalistic, partly because... In, or storytelling? In, well, yeah, I think storytelling is part of it. Yeah. I, think, I think the journalistic bit is interesting because there's no one listening to the stories coming out of um, that region four years after the... The, the, the tsunami. Um, there's, there's very little in the way of uh, political and social will to address the, the problems that, that people still have there. As, as you say, the, the, you know, thousands of people still homeless in temporary accommodation. 
uh, with, with no sense of what their futures might hold. So the, the notion of a, of, of, a, of a camp being called happiness is, is ironic, you know. Mm. It, it clearly has a kind of journalistic handle to it if, if you wanted to develop it in that way, but there's very little exposure, there's very little that you can do with that material. The Japanese broadcasters won't pay any attention to, to what's happening there. They're, they're much more diverted now by preparing for the, uh, the next uh, Olympics. You know, and all, and all the energy, and all the finance, and all the and all the construction, all the crews. construction comes is, is is going there. You you can't afford to build a house in Tohoku, yeah. because the cost of building has gone through the roof because all the contractors are going for the big bucks. If it helps, I am trying to interest Radio Four in making a documentary about it, but I don't but, know what yeah. success <laughs> will have. Now we mentioned that we first entangled on Kate Farewell, and that David Buckland is here from Kate Farewell. We've got at least one other Kate Fareweller among us as well. Um, it is a little kind of community, but you talked about it being a, an influence on you. Just for those who have known nothing about it, what, what did it, what did it, what was it, what did it do for you, and what's it done to your work since? <laughs> Which are three uh, biggies, I know, <laughs> but in uh, say thirty seconds or less. I, I, uh, I, I, I can't deny that it was an, an immensely moving experience to be in a place where you weren't really supposed to be, to be in a place where you didn't really understand what was going on other than instinctively and, and a place that I think is because of its um, very very strong visual presence has, has inspired a number of bodies of work. I mean so far this also sounds like sneaking into an 18 certificate movie when you're a child but we should say that <laughs> Kate Farewell are voyages combining yeah, yeah, artists, yeah. scientists going to places where you can yeah. see the effects of climate change yeah, I, I think I think at the, the time, and, I mean, David can express it better than I can, but it's you know, not his night. It's not his night, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and put words from his mouth into mine for a while. But you know, it was an opportunity to, to create a cultural response to something which, you know, needed a, a different register of, uh, of response, and, and and also to create an amazing opportunity for artists to make to make new work, and that's what it did. And you know, we we toured an exhibition around the world uh, coming out of that. Uh, particular ex expedition and a couple of others. We did the first ever climate show in China. You know, so there has been exposure, there has been a, a whole series of strategies about what to do with the work that came out of those projects. Because yeah, it was about getting it to resonate on a sure. whole bunch of different frequencies to the normal ones that were Absolutely. just the climate scientists, yeah. the political journalists and whatever, and yeah. to get to different people through musicians, yeah. through yeah. Yeah. artists. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And you've also been subsequently, in an entirely unrelated way, involved in some other voyages yeah. as well, the What yeah. Has to Be Done project, which I've also been briefly entangled with. Yeah. You want to say just a teeny bit about that? Well, that's documented in the it is. publication. But Not everyone's uh, speed read tonight. So no, far. well, it's on page 73 onwards. I okay, just a yeah. well, small <laughs> pause while you all turn to page 73 <laughs> of your hymn books. Um, no, I, I think what that's done is, is, is in a kind of micro way, has, has started to, to recognise... Well, the, the, the shift in the climate debates, you know, it's, it's not just the Arctic, it's, it's the whole of the, you know, the planet, basically, that's, 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 that's being affected. And some of, some of the issues are, are much more closely focused, you know, closer to home. But that, that particular project was also referencing the, the idea of the, 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 the boat as a kind of facilitator of a, of, of a, if you like, a kind of action research model of, of bringing people together in very, very close proximity and codependency, uh, particularly a sailing boat that you've got to be, you know, having your wits about to sail. So there's, there's, there's a kind of physicality of understanding the way the boat works and how, how that functions in an environment where you're aware of the wind and the tides and, and so on. So there's, there's an engagement that, that comes, comes about from that. But yeah, it's a wonderful microcosm, isn't it? It's the realisation that you are linked to the environment absolutely. very immediately, because if you don't pull that sail up right now, you're yeah. not going anywhere, or you're yeah. going somewhere too so fast. So it, 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 it's a kind of, if you like, a kind of heightening of some of the relationship that we do have, but in a, in a way that, again, as you say, puts you in a, a kind of central position to that. You know, where are we going to go today? Well, we'll see what the wind's like. You know, we'll see what the temperature's like. We'll see if it's raining. We see how much food we've got, you know. So there's there's a kind of heightening of, 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 of activity that's that's generated not just by by our own wishes, but by responding to the the, the natural world. The the other thing about that project was that it it kind of followed from a project in 1980 by Joseph Boyce, who did a similar set of voyages around the same uh, Western Isles, 
uh, in a boat called the Marquez, which was used as a replica of Darwin's beagle. So there's, there's, a, there's a kind of provenance of the project that goes, goes way back. Um, and the, the, the boat we used for our project was a, a similar boat to the Marquez. So there was a kind of re, re-voyaging or a retracing of some of the steps of that, that early project. But that also gave us a, a different take on what the, the, the kind of environmental and climate issues are now compared to what they were in 1980. Uh, Boyce's argument was about nuclear power, about having to take a stand against nuclear power and you know, looking at alternative technologies as a way of um, being more responsible about power generation. That, in the voyage that we made, was not a major agenda. Um, it was, and it's also interesting how events have evolved to recontextualise that yeah. nuclear power, so it's itself seen as an alternative by some people. Quite, and you've got this strange kind of rhetoric coming out of people like Lovelock now, which is, you know, nuclear power is probably the best bet we've got. And then you go to Fukushima and say, hang on, no, that's not right. So, you know, there's, there's a much, much more complex set of arguments and set of issues yeah. uh, than there were maybe 25 years ago. Yeah. And I like the way, like you said, that all these things do connect in weird ways. It's like when you showed that photograph from near the end of the, of the Japanese hotel, outside were three of those great big machines you get all over Japan, these vending machines yeah, that consume. Yeah. And last week I was interviewing this German photographer, Benedict Partenheimer, who's done a project about how much they consume and how much is it? About the output of Fukushima yeah. is what they consume yeah. because they're on day and night. So yeah. you find all these weird links. Now there's so many other projects and things and aspects of your life, including, of course, Sheffield football that we could talk about but I do want to keep this moving. we have one more small surprise as an element of the evening just to warn you as well but before we get that one final we haven't said anything about the the Nansen initiative and I don't want really to say much but just a little bit because this is an ongoing project as well yeah, it's another it's, example not just of you playing journalist but maybe getting involved in being policymaker. yeah it's not referenced in any of the the, 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 the publication but I, I, I've been invited by the Nansen initiative which is a, an NGO based in Geneva funded by the UN, to uh, participate in a project which is creating um, legislation or trying to create legislation for the uh, refugee rights for uh, people who are displaced through natural disasters, cross-border displacement. So you know, there's something like 8 million people a year have to flee their homes due to some kind of environmental uh, impact, uh, whether that be typhoons, whether that be earthquakes, tsunamis, so on and so on, or, or even you know, the, the kind of spread of, uh, of disease that's, that's related to, to, to climate, climate change. And this has just been in the headlines in the last couple of days with all the stuff yeah. in Vanuatu. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working with, uh, with the Nansen Initiative. Nansen, for those who don't know, Nansen was an explorer, a uh, Norwegian explorer. He was he, one of the first people, I think, to also be a human rights um, campaigner very involved in the League of Nations, and League that's what he got his Nobel yeah. Prize for, yeah. was his work with the League of Nations. So, you know, the, the, the project is you know, quite rightly named after him. But uh, it, it's about trying to, again, use the kind of cultural environment as a way of foregrounding some of the issues. I mean, the, the, the Nansen Initiative is mainly uh, lawyers and, and, uh, that sounds fun. and policy makers. Yeah, they're really, really interesting people. Right, okay. Uh, no, they are. Okay. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to be part of a discussion that's kind of different to one, one that I'm normally part of. But, but the, the, the project is very much about how we can visualise some of the issues that they're trying to wrestle with and, again, to kind of raise public awareness through cultural production about some of the issues. So we'll be looking at, uh, you know, some of the areas that have been affected and also the responses that artists are making across the world. One last question from me before I open it up, because the, it, since this is a professorial platform lecture, I should do one sort of grown-up serious question to put you on the spot. <laughs> what, any thoughts on what the strategy for an institution like this should be in terms of meaningful creative practice? There are people here who would answer it better than I can. <laughs> They'll um, get their turn. But again, I, I think one of the things that's emerging as a discourse is wh- whether or not we should be brave enough or whether we should be dogmatic enough to say we're only going to support work that addresses important issues of our time and that the function of art is to really have a purpose 
to um, make a contribution to raise awareness, create understanding, create dialogue, create discourse around some of the issues that we, we feel are important. And one of the terms we're talking about you know, among some people is, is about resilience. You know, should, should we be saying that the function of, 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 of our institution as a cultural institution should be about addressing resilience? And should we be focusing our individual and collective efforts towards making statements that actually you know, help to create a difference through um, the, the way that, that we can express concerns? So that's not to suggest it should have a message. It can be oblique, it can be tangential, yeah, but it should it, be but the, relevant the, the, in some way. There should be a focus. So when, whenever we do talks, whenever we fund projects, whenever we have exhibitions, whenever we set curriculum, you know. Now, some people would violently disagree with that and say we're instrumentalising practice. But, you know, I'd like to make that debate live and uh, see where we go with it. Let's make that debate live. Okay, before I open, uh, I'm feeling even more Alan Partridge-like than usual. I've delegated this to Lynn to hand around the microphone here. Um, so it can be a comment, it can be a question, it can be a thought, but preferably it's not an awkward pause. <laughs> so if we can just cut that customary gap before the first one. Is that a ha wave goodbye or a hand? I think it was a wave goodbye. Yeah, the person I'm with a hand. To somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Just a point that when somebody's looking for questions, it could be misconstrued. <laughs> Maybe nobody's got anything to ask. Excellent. This is uh, a Cape Farewella. Slightly fanciful, but the, um, when you, the picture of the uh, fishing fleet, which looked like Morse code, did you check to see whether it did actually spell anything out? <coughs> well, it, it doesn't. Um, Are you sure? But did yeah. you check? Yeah. Right, right, okay. It, okay. it, it has no... No, no I realise it's a random, to. I mean, they, they don't know that they're in that any particular Absolutely order, but I thought it would not. be interesting no. if actually it did spell something. No, it, it, it just had the same kind of sense of spacing and shape and size yeah. and luminosity. That just, just, you know, if you put a Morse code signal next to it, you would, you would immediately think they were from the same, same kind of source. Yeah. One, one is yes, logical it did look and like that. structured and one is completely random. Chris is applying for an 8 billion yen grant to go back there and manoeuvre the entire fishing fleet to spell some meaningful message. <laughs> Any others? They don't have to be Morse code related. There's one right up there as well. There's one right up there, isn't there? I'll come to you in a second. Oh, sorry. Um, this is more of an observation, but following on from the last question, there, there was a head of um, painting at um, Canterbury College of Art who was retired out of the Air Force because he became Morse mad. And apparently he, he, he first realized it when he was driving along the M2. And he would read the frequency of headlights in terms of longs and shorts. And so everything and the drawing of curtains in houses. <laughs> so just an observation. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're trying to warn me about something. Yes. <laughs> It's part observation, part early stage diagnosis. Lynn, we're going to send you right over to the other side, please. Sorry, you might be better to just puff, throw the microphone across the room. I'm not sure if I should make more serious tone after that. It was rather amusing. But anyway, um, I just wonder if you could elaborate a bit about um, what you your... Um, your take on integrity in your work. So you talked just very slightly about um, the means of producing the picture, and I know that you have quite interesting and strong views about that, and I wonder if you could just elaborate a bit on that, that what that means to you in terms of composing your, well, anything to do with your work in terms of the notion of integrity for you. Yeah, I, I think the, the main things for, for me are... <coughs> to understand the way the photographic process works as a means of recording. So I'm, I'm, I'm very much um, attuned to just how, how cameras work, how, how that process of gathering imagery works, and how the processing of that works through to a, a, a print. Um, and that's something I've evolved over time. Um, so I, I need to be completely comfortable with the technology. F 
for, 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 for a number of reasons. One, I'm, I'm used to using it in very extreme conditions. It has to be reliable, and it has to, you know, be straightforward to, to use. The, the reason for that is that the, the camera becomes almost a witness. It, it, it becomes, if you like, a kind of audience for a series of actions that either are played out by me or by somebody else. It, it doesn't really matter whether it's me or somebody else. Um, but the, the camera has to be able to record those, those actions. And those actions might be people's movement, it might be introduction of, of lighting, introduction of other interruptive elements that form part of the composition. So in, in, in a way, the, 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 the emphasis is about controlling what happens in front of the camera as opposed to a post-production process of taking whatever comes into the camera and then somehow through various technologies manipulating that into something that, that, that might or could look very similar to what you see here. But, but if, if you mean the integrity, the integrity for me is about the actions, about the, 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 uh, the specificness of place, of activity, and of the camera being able to success, successfully record that in such a way that what's presented is, is through, through the negative or through the file is very much a, you know, an accurate rendition of, of what happened. So in a sense, it's kind of almost ul ultimate documentary. But how does that fit with the age we live in? I saw some of the trouble you went to to get some of those red iceberg images and the setups and the time and the preparation. But we live in an era where we have an expectation of manipulation. There'll be people who look at those and, and you have to explain to them this was not done in Photoshop. This is actually how it looked if you were there. Well, I, I think in a way that because, because of that, you know, pretty dominant um, engagement with manipulated imagery, it, it's even more important to create something that is, in a sense, you know, a kind of critique of that or an alternative to that. I'm, I'm not saying in any way that that way of working is, is invalid but it's, it's not valid for me. No, what I'm getting at, though, is you know, and I know because I was there, <laughs> but somebody else looking at that image, it's, even if you say, so, P.S., this was not done in, you know, people, are, people don't yeah. necessarily well, clock I, that. I think if you look at the images carefully, you would see it. You think we know on a I, I, I think, I think I think you would. You would find enough clues in the images to say this, this couldn't have been done in right. that way. Okay. Yeah. Even when it's something as out of our, most of our lives. I mean, even seeing an iceberg in the water for most of us is pretty weird to start with, even before you've made it red. Uh, we're going to go to the front here. Well, near the front. Um, you, you talked about the performative elements within the photo, and I wondered how important it was for you that your work is the still image, or whether there's a point at which you might be interested in the choreography, you know, the, the performance itself as existing in its own right without the capturing it and the documenting of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of extends from that question about integrity. It, it's about the, 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 the fact that the work is time-based, you know, that there's a duration of uh, some of the activities in front of the camera, but they're they're durations that are made with an understanding of what happens photographically to duration as opposed to what happens in, say, film or video. I mean, film and video, you know, is, is, is a series of frames as well, you know, but they're just, they're just faster. Um, what I'm trying to do is, is to use the particular characteristics of still photography as a way of capturing time over a, a duration or in, into one image. In a way that you, you couldn't do that with with with, uh, with with you know what we call moving image, so an exposure could be an hour long, or it could be half an hour, or it could be 15 seconds, and that that would be an accumulation of, of of light being stored in the camera, being stored on the film or on the file. So that you know for, for me is important that that the the duration is translated into the still image as as, as a kind of unique way of recording duration. 
course, in 30 years, you've moved from black and white to colour. In another 30, you might move from still to moving. You know, it's, it could I, I don't think I will. <laughs> I've, I've tried making films, and I can't, I can't do it. I just, I just don't have... I'm not wired up in the, in the way to make films in the way that maybe some filmmakers wouldn't want to make still images. It just doesn't work for me. It just doesn't, doesn't work. Go there. For, oh, sorry. We're going to go with the microphone, as it seems unfair. I grabbed unfair. the microphone. Sorry, Malcolm, I'll pass it to you. <laughs> um, when Michael Snow made La Région Centrale, mm. one of the things that he was very um, careful to do was to leave no mark on yeah. the landscape. Yeah. Um, when he had done. I think he probably hammered one nail into the rock and it may still be there. Yeah. But what I really like about those, um, those projected colour pieces of yours, it's as if this eye comes to the place that could be an aggressive um, eye taking in, grasping the landscape, but actually once that light is off, you haven't touched the pristine whiteness of, of, of the ice. And I think that that seems to me to resonate rather nicely with Michael Snow's work. Mm, yeah. I mean, that, that film is a, a real reference point for me. Yeah. We could show it, but we'd be here all night, wouldn't we? So, <laughs> it's yeah. but we, it's won't, we won't be here all night, but I do want to take a few more before we... Sort of <coughs> okay. Chris, Hold it close. I think it was working. I can show I usually do. Um, Chris, insofar as looking at the work that any of you want to think of in terms of resilience, it's questions of future orientation, reading the terrain, warning signals. How, how to pick up on your final comments, could we rethink the curriculum in art and design to encompass that orientation towards the future? <laughs> More questions. <laughs> I, I think we probably have to talk about responsibility. I think you'd have to put that at the center of the, of the process about what what responsibility are we taking on as artists, as designers, as thinkers, as makers? You know, and, and, and start from, you know, a, a pretty, I think, you know, well-argued set of values about production, um, about reception, about impact. I mean, in a sense, taking almost a research agenda and not 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 kind of diluting it, but actually running that through into a you know, a, a kind of progressive curriculum of what, what are the what are the kind of functions and processes of, of making work? Where does research sit? Where does where does responsibility sit? Where does dissemination sit? It's, it's a much bigger question, but I, you know, I, I think it is for me. It's about looking where responsibility is. Okay, short sure. answers. We're going to go to the guy in the Gagarin T-shirt there. <laughs> That's my phone. I was just wondering how do you think the theme of verticality that appears so much in your work has inspired you in that sense? I think enormously. Um, I mean, as, as you know, I'm never too far away from boats. <laughs> you know, and that, that has had a, a huge effect. I mean, the, the Cape for World trip was on a boat. I live on a boat. You know, there's, there's always a kind of sense of, you know, being, being connected to very, very fundamental things, uh, tides, you know, uh, state of our rivers, state of our, our seas, you know, knowing the moon phases, knowing where the stars are in the sky, the, you know, it, it's all part of the, the process and I think just, just that thing of for the last 15 years living on a boat has been quite instrumental in that process. It's the cosmic and the nautical yeah. in response to a guy with a cosmonaut on his yep. t-shirt. So. Yep. See what I did there? <laughs> uh, that might be as good a point as any to, to say, can we now, just for now, thank you for Chris. This is just one phase. <laughs> this is where we have a whirring switch of direction. Chris Wainwright, anagram, a whirring switch. And it's now <laughs> us posing the questions. So those of you who know Chris will know he has few loves in life greater <laughs> than a good pub quiz. Now we're not in a pub but we're going to try and simulate it. Even on the What Has To Be Done voyage we had a pub quiz that we did between us a float off the west coast of Scotland with the sun setting and dolphins and porpoises jumping out of the water. Lynn has agreed to be one of the... No, no, we can't, we can't quite simulate it to that degree but we are going to attempt to give you a feel 
of a Chris quiz. So we're handing out sheets now. Hopefully you've got some pens amongst yourselves, if not kind of gather together. There is a prize which relates to the t-shirt that Chris is wearing. A lot not, more... not the t-shirt. Not the t-shirt. <laughs> the prize is that Chris will wear the t-shirt at all times. It's supposed to try and rumble up a pen, but there is a, there is a prize that I think is worth having. All the questions, and there are only 19, all the questions are based on things you've heard tonight from Chris, things that are in the book, things that you might know from knowing Chris, and just general stuff. But it is meant to be a bit of fun. Chris was very, very insistent that this was an element of this evening. So most of these questions are of Chris's own devising. <laughs> I'll have you know. But I'm going to take the role of being your quiz master. Chris, you're going to operate the uh, slides, I believe. Yep, the I'll projector. Do I'll do the... Uh... So let us know when you've all got your paper. I've got a spare pen if anybody's really desperate. Hands up if you've still not got a quiz sheet. Oh, right, okay. You, you can form teams, but then there's only one prize, and it's not really a very divisible prize. So, absolutely not. The tension is building here. Chris, I think you should use just this gap to explain why you thought a, professor, a professorial. You can do it from the microphone there if you like, but why you why you felt that a professorial platform lecture should culminate in a pub quiz. Is it on? I don't think we need one, really. I'm not sure people are concentrating. Should we give an answer? No, well, I think people are not listening. So. Okay, has everyone got a sheet? Have most of you got writing implements of some kind? The hardcore can do it in blood, if needs be. Okay, so, 20 questions. Nice and easy. It is meant to be fun, and yeah, hopefully it will be as well. So I mentioned that we'd done a pub quiz before on the What Has To Be Done voyage, which was on this 102-foot brigantine square rigger called the Lady of Avenel. So how many more sails does a brigantine have than a schooner? No, no, no. It's, no the questions are going to be like that. No, is it? <laughs> the Lady of Avenel is named after Mary Avenel, a character in a novel by Sir Walter Scott. Can you name the novel? Is it A... The Heart of Midlothian, B, The Bride of Lammermoor, C, The Monastery, or D, The Lady of the Lake. Could you repeat the question, please? <laughs> yes. If a train leaves Chicago at the same time... No, sorry. <laughs> so the Lady of Avenel, which was the vessel in which the What Has to Be Done voyage, is a 102-foot brigantine square rigger. It is named after a character in a novel by Sir Walter Scott. One of these is that novel, A, B, C, or D. It is either The Heart of Midlothian, The Bride of Lammermoor, The Monastery, or The Lady of the Lake. These are all Sir Walter Scott novels. I think one of them is also a Raymond Chandler, isn't it? Yeah, so just tick a box, A, B, C, or D. You don't need to write it down. Right, now whatever the right answer is, I can reveal that it is not Chris's favorite novel. But which one of these four is? Is it A, Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern? B, A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole? C, Jimmy Corrigan, The Smartest Kid on Earth by Chris Ware? Or D, If on a Winter's Night a Traveller by Italo Calvino? Mm. Look at Chris, look at those questions. Surely it's obvious. <laughs> Okay, question three. So we just need you just to write down A, B, C, or D. There's nothing more complicated than that. No heavy ink involved. Right. Chris's favourite radio programme used to be the one that was referred to earlier. Um, something called Material World, which I quite like too. Uh, now, since the world ended, what is now his top listen? Is it A, In Our Time? B, The Today Programme? 
C, thinking aloud, or D, the shipping forecast? Okay, all done? I'm moving along swiftly because drink is, well, I'm standing between you and drink, which is a terrible thing to do. So this is, next one's really easy because Chris has talked about it at slightly more length than I was expecting him to in his presentation <laughs> earlier. Which creature, according to Japanese mythology, causes earthquakes? Inugami, the dog god. Namazu, the giant catfish. Karakasa Obaki, the umbrella ghost. Or Godzilla. I know what my four-year-old would say, but he'd be wrong. And also, probably equally easy, given the way the conversation went as well. So often known in the West as the Fukushima disaster, but usually referred to in Japan as being the Great Eastern Earthquake and Tsunami. Chris mentioned several times the exact date and the fact that he left Japan only a few days earlier. Was that exact date 9th March 2011, 11th March 2011, 9th March 2012, or 11th March 2012? Don't feel the urge to shout it out loud. <laughs> You've got a one in four chance if all else fails, right? I'm just going to keep moving at great speed. Okay. Now, the first ever goal in the English Premiership was scored by Brian Dean. If I said what team is he from, you'd all know, if you know Chris, that it's going to be the Blades, Sheffield United. But who conceded it? The first goal ever conceded in the Premier League. A. Everton. <laughs> B, Liverpool. You see, it's not all the same little pools of knowledge you can rely on here. B, Liverpool. C, Manchester United. Or D, Wolverhampton Wanderers. Right. Now, Chris talked about the Nansen Initiative, and there is a vessel that's associated with Nansen that is said, said still to have sailed further north and further south than any other wooden vessel. Uh, it was used in Nansen's Arctic expedition. It was used in Amundsen's successful attempt to be the first person to the South Pole. What is its name? Is it A, the Karluk, B, the King and Vinga, I believe it's pronounced, C, the Fram, or C, the Volodarsky. I have not checked these pronunciations with the BBC pronunciation unit, but... Okay, everyone happy? Okay. Right, the Arctic Circle, as I'm sure you all know, is not fixed. It is currently drifting northwards at a speed of about 15 metres a year. But approximately, what latitude is it at right now? 49 north, 40, 66 degrees north, 72 degrees north, or 80 degrees north? <coughs> 49, 66, 72, 80. Latitude. Arctic Circle. Not the North Pole, for heaven's sake. Yeah, no, not many. Maybe the moon's around as well, but it's the Arctic Circle. People think the Arctic Circle is fixed, unlike the magnetic pole. We can talk about this later if you like. Right. <laughs> what is the capital of Greenland? Iqaluit, Nuuk, Umanak, or Copenhagen? Greenland. What is the capital of Greenland? Yeah, let me. I can repeat any of these questions if you need me to. Although I haven't got them numbered on my sheet, so it could get complicated. So, Iqaluit, Nuuk, Umanak, or Copenhagen? <laughs> We're clearly in the Arctic section of the quiz here. Right, at the end of the month, they play Estonia, but what colour is the main strip of the Icelandic national football team? <laughs> is it? I'm sure you've all watched them on Sky Sports 15. Uh, is it white with a red stripe across the chest? <laughs> Is it red with a white stripe across the chest? Is it blue with a white stripe across the chest? Or is it blue with a red stripe across the chest? <laughs> right, this next question 
relates to the t-shirt and relates to the prize. What was discovered on the 4th July 2012 at CERN in Switzerland? The Higgs boson, the Higgs boson, the Higgs bison, or the Higgs bassoon? <laughs> hey, we thought you needed some light relief. <laughs> at least two of those regularly appear in print as mistakes, is all I will tell you, so... Okay, now that we know that one, I can tell you that whatever it is that's on that t-shirt, which first on that t-shirt there, we have a book. We can show it to you here. This is the prize. This is in the actual hand handwriting of Sir Peter Bassoon, <laughs> or the unnamed finder of the Higgs, whatever it is. Sir Peter Higgs, signed. That is an actual CERN notebook with the actual formula that relates to it, <laughs> explaining the standard theory. Now, on the same theme, what is the more commonly used term for visible radiation? A, photons, B, the electromagnetic spectrum, C, ultraviolet, or D, light? Not D light, D light. <laughs> what is the more commonly used term for visible radiation? Photons, electromagnetic spectrum, ultraviolet, or light? Now, where do high-octane, high-latitude band of monsters and men hail from? Iceland, the Faroes, Svalbard, or Greenland? Yeah, there's a band. They're called of monsters and men. They come from one of these four countries. Iceland, Faroes, Svalbard, or Greenland. If you want a clue, Björk is not a member. Right. Okay, next. Forecast what is next in the sequence. Fitzroy, Sol, Lundy. And I'll try and do that shining more like Charlotte Green. Fitzroy, Sol, Lundy. What's next? Is it Trafalgar, Irish Sea, Fastnet, or Pharaohs? You've all heard it if you ever listen to Radio 4. Does this relate to question 3? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> All the questions are structured to within an inch of their lives. Right. Yeah, okay. So this is a sequence in the shipping forecast. I can give this much away. And every night when they do the shipping forecast and every afternoon they go Fitzroy, Sol, Lundy, and then the next one is always one of these four. But is it Trafalgar, Irish Sea, Fastnet or Faroes? Or Fastnet if you're in the south. Right, next, a question I think none of you are anticipating. Whose autobiography is The Moon's a Balloon? Is it Richard Branson, Felix Baumgartner, Don Cameron, or David Niven? <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's excitement. Oriana knows an answer. This is good. Really? <laughs> right, we're nearly there. You'll be glad to know. What is the term for a second full moon in a calendar month? Is it a betrayer moon, a blue moon, the old moon in the new moon's arms, or a hunter's moon? Second full moon in a calendar month. And, just to show how cunningly planned this all is, who in 1934 wrote Blue Moon? Was it <laughs> Rogers and Hart, Rogers and Hammerstein, Jerome Kern, or Johnny Mercer? See, we have references to with it bands from somewhere up north <laughs> and to 1930 songwriters. Okay, July 20th or July 21st, 1969, depending where you were, uh, we put a man on the moon for the first time and the second time. They were Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin of Apollo 11. But who was the poor bloke who had to stay up in the command module? Was it A, Michael Collins, B, Harry Boland, 
C, Al Shepard, or D, Charlie Duke? The third man in the Apollo 11 mission. Right. Right. Finally, question 19. What, do you want more? Oh, it's 18? Does it? Oh, well. There's no 18. Ah. Well, this will make, yeah, we'll make this one 18. It doesn't really matter. It's fine. There is a 19th question anyway. It's all planned. It's just misnumbered. Call this 18. Call this 18. This one, this one. Yeah, this is now question 18. We spent a lot of time on this, really. Right. It is the eclipse, as you might be aware, on Friday, the first one to be visible from large chunks of Europe since the one of 1999. But if you want to be on land and see the full thing properly from the zone of totality, where do you need to be? A, anywhere in the Arctic Circle. B, anywhere from the north of Scotland right up to the North Pole. C, Greenland or Iceland, or D, the Faroes or Svalbard. So where do you need to be to properly see the eclipse that's happening on Friday? And if you didn't know there was an eclipse on Friday, just treat that as a free bonus piece of information. And finally, by popular request, the bonus question, which is actually meant to be a throwaway question at the end that didn't count, but what the hell, we'll include it now. Has this evening been A, scintillating, B, inspiring, C, enlightening, or D, all of the above? <laughs> yeah, you will not be marked on the last question, okay? You can give any answer you wish to do. So, if you have finished, can you please swap your sheets with people you genuinely don't know? It kind of takes the fun away if you actually just lie. I don't need to show him again, I think he can come join us. Okay, fine. Okay, has everybody swapped? This is all that stands between you and your drink. So, the Sir Walter Scott novel in which the Lady of Avenel appears is The Monastery, C. Good reaction. Chris's favourite novel is Fifty. Sh sorry, is Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern. <laughs> Which is why I've done the quiz backwards in his honour. Uh, Chris's favourite radio program of ones which are currently broadcast on Radio Four is the Today program. B. Oh, no. No, I know. <laughs> You can't argue with him, it's his favourite programme. <laughs> right, the shivering, shaking creature causing earthquakes in Japan is of course Namazu the giant catfish, B. And the date of the Great Eastern Earthquake is 9th March 2011, A. No, no. No, it's 11th. 11th March. I got that wrong the first time. I'll get it wrong again now. 11th of March. Apologies. I, miss, I knew the right answer. I said it wrong. 11th March 2011. Let's try that one more time. The 11th March 2011 B. I hate it when quiz masters get it wrong. Right. The first ever goal in the Premiership was scored by Sheffield United. And much to my joy, it was scored against Manchester United. C. Steve Reed's gone home. He couldn't face it. <coughs> right. The vessel that's been further up north and further south while still made of wood, discounting the Contiki, is C, the Fram. The Arctic Circle is currently at about 66 and a half degrees north. B. 
Yeah, well, it's also there now. It's only moving 15 feet a year. It's all right. The capital of Greenland is B, Nook. We kind of hope that by saying Copenhagen, you'd think it was a trick, uh, trick question. Right, on March the 31st, when Iceland kick off against Estonia, they will, we hope, be playing in blue with a red stripe across the chest. D. Can I just suggest, given the population of Iceland, there's probably more cheering at that answer than there will be when they kick off again in their football match. I sincerely hope that everybody for the next question got A, the Higgs boson. Right? You, you seem to be shocked that you actually know Chris. It's a bit of a surprise. The commonly used term for visible radiation is light, D. A. Boson. Yeah, A, boson, D, light. Right? Of monsters and men come from A, Iceland. You can find them just behind the freezer section. Uh, in the next sequence is Fitzroy, Sol, Lundy, Fastnet. C. C, Fastnet. The Moons of Balloon is the autobiography which I discovered that Chris and I both, for reasons unknown to us, read when in our teenage years, I have no idea why. It is of David Niven, which is D, D for David Niven. The term for a second full moon in a calendar month is B, Blue Moon. Also the song of Manchester City Football Club, which is very nice to include it. And in 1934, that song was written by A. Rogers and Hart. Rogers and Hart, not Rogers and Hammerstone. Rogers and Hart, Lorenz Hart, not Oscar Hammerstein. Uh, 1969. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon. Michael Collins went round it. A. And finally, although it's question 18 of 19, which I thought there were 20, but one didn't count, uh, is the answer is that if you really want to be in the zone of totality, you need to get to the Pharaohs or Svalbard. D. So... Has anybody got... Has anybody got 18? Has anybody got 17? Swap your papers back, please. Chris, come and join us. I think your work is done. Has anybody got 16? We do have tiebreaker questions. I'm kind of hoping to use them. Has anybody got 15? Is anybody in double figures? Yes. All right, fine. Okay, we'll keep going. Has anybody got? Has anybody got fourteen? Has anybody got unlucky for some thirteen? Yeah. Oh! Oh, excellent. We have two. Okay, tiebreaker question. <laughs> okay, our first tiebreaker question is: I said Iceland are playing at the end of the month. Who are they playing? <laughs> it involved listening, didn't it? Not knowledge. Oh, yes, you did. Yes, you did. I said twice. Yeah. Who did I say they're playing? Shout! Shout! Estonia! Estonia. Well shouted. <laughs> you are our winner. Congratulations, come on and claim your prize. Well. I'm so glad it's gone to a mystery stranger who I've never been to the Arctic with twice on voyages, so it's fine. <laughs> so I hope, even though it wasn't part of the quiz, that you all felt reasonably comfortable answering A, B, C or D to the final question of the quiz about what kind of evening this has been. If it is, it is entirely down to the professor whose platform this has been. So can we please, one more time before we adjourn for food, drink and discussions about Icelandic football strips, thank Chris Wayne.